Exciting stuff. Thanks, Pastor Evan. Thank you. Give her a hand as you make it awkward for her as she sits down. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, no, she mentioned we've got an exciting new uh, thing that we want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, we also have an update on the Hill. But this new thing uh, that Pastor Nate is going to talk to you a little about as he, yeah, very mature of you. Um, we are going to be uh, expanding our lobby and uh, giving a new facelift, kind of a facelift to the front of the church. So, uh, and we're going to answer some questions about why. Yeah, woohoo! Very, very exciting news. But we've got some. Uh, can you put that first picture up? Uh, we want to show you what the front of the church is going to look like here. Pastor Nate can walk you through that. Yeah, so that's the front of the church. But really, I guess the the thing to really talk about is what we're doing. We're going to be connecting our two buildings, right? So, um, the, our, when I say our two buildings, our youth building to the main building. And so in order to do that, that's that center portion here uh, in the front of it. Our, our, our front of our building looks great. Our building looks great. This is not about our facelift of our, so much of our building or, or looking great or all that. It is, it is function um, and, and it's exciting. Although when we build or add on, it'll also make it look great. Um, we're going to add that, that center section. There's going to be two uh, 12-foot glass garage doors. that are gonna, It's the space right between us where that fence is. And we're going to connect, again, our lobby and our youth building. So i um, excited about that. Let me show you the inside uh, of what it's going to look like. And so right now where this dotted wall is, the dotted line, that is the current wall of the, it would actually be the same wall that goes uh, in line with the screen all the way down there, all right? Uh, the cafe's on that line. So we're going to tear that wall down, and all of that space uh, between, these, between the buildings will become part of our, our sanctuary or our lobby. Uh, what this will do um, is it will allow the cafe to move, uh, be bigger, service better, um, it, which you're excited about that, but really what it, we're excited about is connecting the youth to this main house. Um, the angled wall right there, it'll, it'll be display of the youth ministry, uh, beyond youth ministry on that wall where you could walk into this, the whole lobby. You're going to see beyond kids. You're going to see beyond youth. And that porch right here, they're going to have their own porch, all right? Um, how many of you know kids, teenagers, they need some of their stuff that's their own? That mom and dad stuff's great, but how many of you know having a place to hang out? We're excited about that. Keep them out of the parking lot. Chain them in a little bit. Um, <laughs> Seriously, though, safety-wise and all that, so but having the whole place that's theirs, that's their porch. Now, if you adults go out there, maybe, you know, they might kick you off, but, um, but th that whole porch, so it'll be a matching, a matching uh, porch on the front of the youth building, and then in between there, there'll be uh, two big glass garage doors that will open uh, for springtime and things like that, just create a great atmosphere. Put that back up, if you will. Oh, and you still got it up there. See that dotted wall where that wall was? We're also going to be putting a partition wall there. Um, what I mean by that is one that can uh, close and open, uh, and we'll be able to use this space uh, not just during church hours, but in additional hours, having a great cafe um, and see our footprint expand uh, just with Awaken and some things that are going on in our hearts um, uh, to reach into this community. So we're excited about that. So yeah. that's uh, what we're doing. And, yeah, and so uh, to maybe you can elaborate on the why a little bit more. Uh, I know you hit a few of those things, but... Uh, a lot of questions come, oh, why are we doing this? Uh, some people like, uh, when it comes to Beyond Church, why do we do construction stuff? Because we just seem to do that every six months. That's just what we do around here, <laughs> right? Uh, this isn't one of those reasons, though. No, no, no <laughs> uh, this, this is not one of those reasons. Yeah, it's not not, a, not at all, in fact. Uh, there's, a, like you said, there's a ton of function yep. uh, for why we're doing this, and I think you probably went over most of it. There. Yeah, yeah, the connecting of, the, of, of us as a family. Yeah. And uh, being at one service... Um, uh, and just the function, uh, as well as uh, why, why we're doing this. Our B team room, which is down on the, uh, it would be the east side of our lobby all the way down there. Um, that's going to be turned into a children's classroom shortly um, because of just having a lot of kids. Um, that's a great thing. It's a growing thing. It's a healthy church. We love that. Uh, and so that, that place will turn into a children's, and that whole wing will be a children's lobby. So we're excited about that, even what it, the possibilities that it allows and affords for our children to have. Um, and, and again, we felt like why we're doing this is the Lord really laid on our hearts real strong this year to pour into children and youth and outreach, right? So our kids and reach out. Well, this does both of those things. It, it's a connection point. It allows us to open up space so we can teach our kids God's word, not just corral a bunch of kids in a room. I mean, you know, teaching 
a, a, a mass chaos, how many of you know they don't get what they need, right? And so we want to make sure that our rooms are, are adequately uh, spaced and, and staffed to where the kids receive the word, but also connecting our youth to where they're not just like out there on their own. That's like the picture of this world today is they're just out there on their own. Just go over there. You're not, no, we're bringing them in and it's going to be a central meeting place. They're going to be coming in and exchanging from every generation. So we're excited about that. And in addition to that, the cafe being able to service more people and a dollar of every drink, being able to go to straight to out, go straight to outreach. We love that. And even just this last week, we were, you know, getting ready to uh, put a, a year-end report or putting all this together, which you're going to see next week. But it's just cool to see the outreach dollars spent. And this year when we do that, we're really endeavoring to let them actually touch your hands more than just be, go out. So we're excited about that this year. So yeah. outreach, children, and you. Yeah. So yeah. that's why. I just realized how weird it is with me just standing down here watching. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to come down here. Uh, I was yeah, supposed to go up there to point. He I, told me, I I, I'm not a good here, rule but... follower, all right? Wow. Jeez. Just thought he wanted me to look up to him more than I already do, <laughs> Pastor Nate. More than I already do. <laughs> oh, that felt good. <clears throat> no, so, uh, hey, he made a good point about the cafe. So, you know, we've got this small space out here for the cafe, and it's just, you know, when the cafe is that small, you can only fit so many humans back there to make drinks, right? Yep. Uh, therefore, uh, we can't service as many people as we want. Therefore, we can't raise as many outreach dollars as we'd like to. Man, to reach beyond the four walls into our community. So we're going to be making that a lot bigger. And uh, what that will uh, allow the cafe to do, too, is we'll eventually have an online ordering system. So you can order your drink on your way to church. Yeah. Man, they're going to get you hooked up. I mean, we made over 4,300 drinks last year. But we, we expect a significant growth from this and uh, really look forward to what Awaken Cafe could become. Uh, expanding our footprint man when you have a business something that's making money with a purpose the mission to see people get jesus man there's nothing like that so uh it's going to be awesome so when when are we going to start this and when do we expect it to be completed <clears throat> sorry so the front porch we're going to start uh in about two two and a half weeks um Ooh. and th that's the front porch and then that corner of the youth building we're going to start that process we have a, a transformer in between uh, the youth building and the main it's got to get moved by og &E. it all depends on their schedule and how wet things are so six to eight weeks they said but we'll try to get you in there quicker so um that being said to in two weeks that'll buy us a little bit of time that only starting a little bit later but that first project as we get going that's going to be one of our hardest the hardest port parts um because of how it's tying in and have cutting the wall off and so anyway two and a half weeks and we expect to have it done i know you're gonna ask that next i was uh, you I were was, i see yeah. you right here yeah. um uh by june by june so that's uh I, I think it should be about a six to eight week project um but it's full full scale onto it hopefully we'll be full scale uh in about six weeks, six, seven weeks, full scale. Awesome. In two weeks, we'll be starting the porch. So there it awesome. is. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Hey, another question. You know, one of the important questions you got to ask when you do something like this, how are we going to pay for that? <laughs> right? I've got like Good four question. responses. People Good don't question. care how we pay for so it. So you're not, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. Figure it out. Uh, yeah. Stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. So stewardship. Really stewardship. stewardship. We're not going to yeah. do a stewardship campaign, but we've stewarded no. the dollars that have come in this last year. Uh, and, and the year before. So we've been putting money aside uh, in savings as well as just our general, uh, our general account. So we're going to be taking a uh, majority of our general account uh, to pour into this because um, I believe this is what the Lord is saying. And, you know, sometimes we need to stop worrying so much about how much something costs and start partnering with what God is doing and what yeah. he's saying. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that has to do with everything. You know, when you, whether it's giving, whether it's tithing, we, we, we go, well, you know how much that's going to cost me? You know what the deal is? If we would stop worrying about how much something costs and start asking ourselves the question, am I partnering with what God is doing? Am I partnering with what God is saying? What would happen is I'd walk in the fulfillment of all my days and the message of Jesus would go beyond these four walls and, and, and satisfy hungry hearts everywhere. I'm telling you, par am I partnering with what God is doing? Am I partnering with what God is saying? So how are we paying for this? I'm not asking you to partner. Look, we've, we've stewarded every dollar that's come in this past year. Why? Because it's valuable. We make a prayer before we receive these tithes and offerings that says, Father, to, to expand. Father, commit to your work, to your service, that the message of Jesus would go beyond these four walls. Make it reach further. I'm telling you, we've seen, even this last year, the dollars that have been stewarded with the budget and all those kind of things over the last two years afford this without a dollar being raised. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. That's awesome.
So another question that leads into, and I'll sit down after I ask this, but so is this going to impact the progress on the hill or slow the hill? Or, and, and I'll just preface it with this before you answer that, uh, how many of you know what the hill is? Let me see a raise of hands, very classroom. See, so there, that's awesome. So some of you do, some of you don't. So I want you to just explain, what is the hill? When I hear about that, what is it? And uh, is it, for the, for the ones who know about it, you know, is it going to impact the progress there? For the ones who don't, what is it? And can we talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, so absolutely not. Can I sit down? Not at all it's going to impact. Um, okay. I, the only impact, yeah, sit down, <laughs> sit down. The only impact, thanks for helping me lead through that, because otherwise they, I get off or whatever. But um, <clears throat> it's not going to impact the hill progress at all. The only impact it would have would be uh, creating more space uh, so that the, the, the hill would go a little bit quicker. Um, because the hill is, is one of these things that we've had in our heart, and we're not just continuing, but you're going to see the gas poured on and, and move ahead way faster. This is not in lieu. This is not uh, uh, to stall the hill. This is, the hill is stronger and in our hearts more than ever. Matter of fact, some things have expanded, um, additional, like uh, the pond. And so the hill, what is it? Thank you. The hill is a, it's the place right across here from the hilltop. It's the future home of Beyond Church, but it's a, uh, it's a building project that we have to, to build Beyond Church, to go beyond the four walls, and we're going to start with this uh, phase of a project called uh, the park. The park, it's going to play, be a place for our community right here, but also for our community. It's going to be a place that the love of God is amplified. There's going to be a mess, like the, all the, you'll have to watch this here in just a moment, but I want you to just hear that there's going to be a message of Jesus amplified from that place for all of the world to hear, and I, for God to be honored and not to turn the volume down, in other words, you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, I mean, even uh, just the, the, the trail around the park have an imprint in the ground that declare things to people about what God says. Maybe they're going through cancer. Maybe they're dealing with a, a marriage thing. Maybe they're dealing with something with their kids and declarations as they walk around. They just get to hear and experience the Lord on, on this place, the hill. So this is a, our next step. It's not the building first. It's this place first, right? And I, I believe it's significant. And I know in my, with all my heart, this is the right step. And so I'm excited about that. I want you to see this video. And then I want to talk to you about what's happening. And as we see things progress uh, for pretty quickly here, let's go ahead and hit that video. Awesome. So behind where that pavilion, come on, yeah. I'm telling you what, it's, I'm excited about this. So uh, behind that pavilion, there's going to be an additional palm. We're excited about that for the water feature and just, uh, just that feel. If you've seen the gathering place, if you've got to go spend some time there, um, this is something that before we even, uh, I didn't even heard of the gathering place. This is something that the Lord had dropped into our heart and for this place to have something like that and for this church and the church to be the one that provides that because how many of you know it's not the government? Listen, and even business, you know, I love this awaken thing. Uh, I believe there should be a business side to ministry. Uh, there, should, there should be Warren Buffett's in the kingdom of God. In other words, that every dollar he has, he's pushing his agenda. You know what, whose agenda needs to be pushed more than anybody is the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this, are we doing that to the best of our abilities or are our jobs for us, right? And I know that sounds funny, taking care of our family, but the Bible says that, that we have a houses that are, are paneled and all this kind of stuff, but yet God's house and what his purpose is, it, it's lagging. Matter of fact, this is in Haggai, he said, the people said it's not time yet, but God said, uh, I told you it was time 18 years ago. And so there was a delay and a lag, and, and not only a lag, but there was, they, he, he, God said, hey, consider your ways if when you harvest and when you fill your buckets, if it doesn't seem like there's holes in them. He said, why don't you do what I said, and you'll see the blessing come over and over and over and over, and ultimately the fulfillment of all your days. This is Haggai, all of one and two chapters, right? It's amazing. This is even the church. Why am I here? My life's a vapor. 
And what, how I steward these days, how I steward, listen, my time, how I steward my talents, my gifts, my resources. We're not just talking about dollars here. We're talking about our lives. How am I stewarding it for his kingdom? I'm telling you, there's a word that come, comes out in all this world that tells us, and it's this voice of, of, of money, this voice of stuff, this, mo, this stuff, American dream. Pastor Susan talked about it on, on Wednesday night. The American dream ha, has become this more dream. That's not what God created this nation for. God created this nation to carry a message, to, go, to be able to do and, and, and carry a message unhindered for the glory of God. That's what we're created for. Amen? And so I'm excited about this, this hill. Let me show you a little bit uh, where we're at right now with the dollars that have come in. If you go to uh, Tier 1, this is a $850,000 project. Um, to me, that seems very small. I, we just had our house appraised. Uh, we got it in the mail, and I was like, oh, look at our house is worth a half a million dollars. Yay. You're like, oh, pastor, wow. You just shared that? Yeah. You know what? Half a million dollars is nothing. My house and somebody else's house would pay for this. Is that crazy? I'm just saying that this is, not, this is not that big. If we were to throw all of our houses together here, I'm telling you, I'm just saying, and this is God's house. This is God's house. You're saying, wow, they must pay you well here. They do pay me well. But guess where I got that, that house? I got that house from being faithful to the Lord. And all my life from the time I was young, in sixth and seventh grade, when I saw her give $5 out of a 20 that she got for her birthday, and I told her, hey, honey, that's $2 of the tithe. I did. I, I told her. I said, "Hey, it's two dollars," and and uh, and she had just got some mini corn dogs and a Mountain Dew and bought me some Skittles, and so when she got this change at the youth at the youth snack shop, and and she got the, she got a couple dollars back, right? Because that was when things were cheap, fifty cents you could buy. Anyway, and she got two dollars. Okay, so she got seventeen bucks back, right? I was thinking that worked out good, right? Because now you can give your tithe. And, she, and so I watch what's going on in the offering, and she drops a five in there. And I'm like, honey, that's only, it's only two. She's like, I know. I just, I just wanted to give more. Actually, what I always do is I always double my tithe. I always double my tithe. And, uh, and I was like, that's four. <laughs> true story. This is very true. And she said, I know, but I want to just give more. And when she did that, that day, I was in eighth grade, she was in seventh grade, it went off in my heart, and the conviction of the Lord said, that's what I want from you. I want you to double, and I want more. And for all, from all these days, I remember when I was a senior in high school, uh, um, and this lady, Jalon Lees, uh, just a prayer warrior, uh, our children's uh, pastor at the time, but just, uh, she called, uh, it was, we had, there was a move of God, we went to a private school, and there was a move of God that morning, and, um, and what I mean by that is just the kids were just in the gym, and God just was pouring out, it just was amazing, and we were walking up, and, and um, we were walking up to class, and she said, hey, stop, and so pa Pastor Evan, or my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, um, we were walking up, going to walk upstairs, and she goes, hey, stop, you two, I have a word of the Lord for you. And she said, grab hands. And I was like, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yeah. This is the Lord. Um, but she said, she said this, and, and, I, and, I, and I believe it's true. She said, um, finances will never be a, an issue for you because you've chose to honor me. And I can tell you this. I've seen the blessing of the Lord on my life. Because of simply honoring the Lord. Very simple. And from that time. And you know the Lord moved me here. Went to Ramah. And we moved here. And God. Uh, he, I said Lord what do you want me to do. And that we moved here to, to just help in this church. And I, I felt like the Lord saying start a business. Everyone's like you need to go get a job here. You need to do this. You need this. And the Lord's like start a business. So I said okay. So I went in. And I'm telling you. God blessed my business. When I was 24 years old. I built a house that I ended up selling. For $750,000, okay, that I built at 24 years old. Who built it? No, God built it. Why? Because of faithfulness. And so I did well in that house and all that kind of stuff, but I'm telling you, guess what? I'm still doing well. I was able to steward that dollars and throw it into my next house, and being a builder, I was able to, to roll the egg, if you will. But the coolest thing is, is this. God is not limited if we would just simply give him what we have. 
That's the key. If I would just give them the loaves and the fish, God's not limited. The only limit that God has in, in my life is how much of, him, of how much of my life I'll let him have. That's his only limit. How much, how much of my life is, is, is God's? Is it all of it or is it just some of it? That's the question that you have to answer. The question is, am I partnering with God or am I asking God to partner with me? I'm telling you guys, it, 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 a huge world of difference. And even this, this, this is nothing. I'm telling you, nothing. Nothing. Oh, I just, I just like to throw dollars out there sometimes because sometimes it makes people nervous and it shouldn't. Because who we serve, who's God to you? He's the mighty one. That's who he is. That's who he is to me. He's the mighty one. There's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing too big for him. Matter of fact, I, I know testimonies of people this, just this year seeing promotions in their business that, that they not only doubled, even tripled where they were just in that amount of time. I'm telling you, God is so much bigger than we give him credit for. And that's what we talked about last week. Recognizing the most fundamental thing I could ever do is recognize that there is a creator and, and that what he says goes, and that he is all-powerful, omni, that he is all-present, and he is all-knowing. So if he's asked me to do something, then because he sees the end from the beginning, and I know that he loves me so much that he gave his son for me, why wouldn't I do that? Why? Because I know that he's, his goal is not to get something from me, but to get something to me, to get me to walk in the fullness of why he created me for this time, for this hour, um, at the, this place. God put you here, he put things in your hands, and he's got a plan, and it's to carry a message to go beyond these four walls, the message of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel needs to be preached, not just from a pulpit, but with every dollar and every waking breath that I have and that you have. That's what you were created for. That business that you own, that position that you carry, that's God's. We need to stop baking him birthday cakes and not serving him a slice. Think of that. Hey, I love you so much. My birthday's in a week, right? Less than a week. So I love birthday. I don't like birthday cake. I like strawberry shortcake. There is no slice. But if I was to bake you a cake and it was your birthday and I was like, man, I just love you so much. I just want to have a party for you. It's like, come on over. And I set this cake before you and I start slicing it and you're just like, wow. You're like, this is the whole reason that this is even here is you. The whole reason that this is even here is you. Well, my kids need a piece. How many of you know that's true? How many of you been that, Dad? Kids go first. Honor says what? Honor says the birthday boy goes first. But what happens is, is we got a lot of kids. We got a lot of voices. We got a lot of, and we want to make sure we do this, and we make sure to do this, and we go, and we serve, and we serve, and we serve, and every dollar, every slice gets given out, and then we go, and happy birthday, and we lick the spatula, and we go, well, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. You know, just bless my stuff. Listen. You won't be able to receive the things that you really desire if you don't simply acknowledge the fact of what he says and acknowledge him with your finances. You won't be able to believe, listen, you won't be able to believe that he's your healer. You won't be able to. You won't be able to. It's the very least. It's the foundation of everything. And at the end of the day, God wants you to know his goodness. He wants you to be, be, he wants you to experience what he said. I'm telling you, this is why I'm pastoring. Because God asked me to. Because God asked me to. And above anything else, that's what I'm going to do. Not business, not go build this, not go do this, not just go make money, because that comes easy. But honoring him Honoring him, giving him the first, is, the, is, the, is sometimes the most difficult, but it's the foundation thing to do. It's able. You bring that firstborn, what if mom dies? 
in birth. The, we're talking Abel in the Bible, and he brought a lamb to the Lord to give me the first and the best. The first and the best. What if, what if I don't have any more? I'll give you after I build my flock. Doesn't have, it doesn't work that way. It never has. It never will. And, and let's go back to the hill. I don't know how I got into all this. I'm Tier one, $100,000, just a drop. My pastor used to say, a drop in the Holy Ghost bucket. That's nothing. 100000 bucks uh, is tier one. This is zoning, dirt work, grading, rough and electrical. So we got started, and right now we have 81000 of that 100000 left to spend. We got hung up a little bit in the fall um, just because of not having a permit, uh, which I didn't know we needed, uh, but we got turned in. And so we got the environmental agency involved. So now we have silt fences, yes, and get to do an inspection report every week. Glory to God. Oh, all for his glory. And so that took uh, government time to do, and it brought us from the, the fall when we started scraping uh, through the winter. And so here we are, ready to rock and, and roll again. But there's found that we got a bunch of stuff scraped so we can begin forming. And, and so that it's not just a flat place, but just like it has contours and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of that, that uh, material is in, in the ground yet, uh, in our pond build and things like that. And so rather than push slop, because we don't want to waste our dollars on pushing mud. We need it to dry out just a little, just a skosh. Uh, but these dollars are sitting there ready to be spent. And you're going to be seeing this happen. Like as soon as we get a little bit of dry, we're going to probably be starting up where those trees are. There's going to be a pond in the middle of those trees uh, set up around there. And, and just to the, if you would call the uh, far side north, is where the pavilion of that power pole that's in the center of the dirt is going to be where the uh, pavilion's going to set. So it's going to be overlooking the top pond that'll flow out to the bottom. We're excited about that. And the cool thing is, is that power pole is almost gone. The power company has already moved those poles and repositioned our electric around the outside. So we'll no longer have poles going through the property. So all these things have been going on and we're excited about that. So $81,000 in tier one to be spent. We're excited to get that done. Um, the rough and electric, in other words, putting trenches in the ground with electric and, and different plumbing in place so that when we do our shaping, um, or that'll happen after our shaping, and then also hopefully we can get our pad built for the pavilion. So let's go to tier two. We already have dollars come in for tier two as well. So we're sitting on go, and you're going to see things really trans, uh, uh, happen quickly here very soon. If you can go to the next slide, tier two. And we see that this next slide, uh, slide is a $250,000 mark. So it's a lot larger than the 100000 We have a quarter of that in currently. Uh, let's see here. But we have, we've got the projector for twenty eight k and we have 29000 in that pro tier just sitting there ready to spend. So we have about a little over $110,000 ready to just keep on rolling right now towards this project. We're not taking any dollars from the hill for this, uh, for this lobby expansion. I believe that the lobby, ex it's not even a thing. We don't even have a project name for it because we're just letting you know this is what we're doing. Now, if you want to give to this, here's how I'd ask you to give. If you're a plumber, if you're an electrician, you'd like to help in any way, contact me. You can, I'm here every Sunday and every Wednesday, right? And we, we'll get you to use some of your gifts to cause the dollars to go a little bit further here because we've stewarded them. Again, we're trying to steward these dollars. Or if you say, hey, I can help lay floor when it's time, love to have you involved in that but here's the hill and it works i'm pumped about it I, i'm excited to see for our community and let the love of jesus just go listen the church should be doing things that causes people to stand in awe because our god is a great creator and inside of every one of you is the creator so even for your own places in your own homes listen it should be not a down here excellence is not extravagance excellence is simply attention to detail and that's how God is and if you would put attention to detail even on your job what you would see is people would stand in awe and he take you this is fundamental okay this is fundamental is if you want to, we're talking about some money deals, we're talking about fundamental in the series. The most fundamental thing you could ever do is do everything unto the glory of God. And when you do that, you do it with excellence. What's excellence? It's not extravagance, it's attention to detail. And when you do your job, and you put the trash back like you're supposed to, and you put that extra bag in the bottom, and you, and you get there a little bit early, and you do all these things, what happens is your attention to detail causes people to see God, because when you look at the, an orchid, when you look at uh, the trees, when you look at these things, what do you see? You see detail. If it was just a smudge, how many of you know you wouldn't see God? But it's, it's the details where you see God. And people stand in awe of that, of details. And where you're, when you honor God and you do it for his glory, the Bible says he will honor you. He talks about how he'll bring you before great men. Just doing what you do 
for his glory will cause you to ATD, attention to detail. Attention to detail. What happened is you'll be promoted. And what's in your hands will increase for his glory. The awaken um, thing, I want to talk to that just for a moment. I believe there is to be a business side of ministry. And I'll say it like this. What's in the Father's heart has long, uh, far too long been limited by what is in his people's hands. Now, and he, is, he wants to bring increase to those that steward it well. And that's what I believe he wants to do. And, um, yeah, I just, that's, that, that's, that's the awakened thing, is uh, what's, what's in our hearts, what's in the Father's hearts should not be limited by what's in, just in our hands. But a business that's created, um, and, and it's all for his glory, all the prophets, it is a non-profit, but it is for profit, and it's for the glory of God. That's what my life is for, that's what your life is for, whether you know it or not, and that's what you're created for. Anyway, um. I didn't tell you we we're going to be taking up tithes and offerings right now because I didn't want my, my encouraging you uh, to make you feel like I'm trying to get you to give. Because at the end of the day, this is your heart decision. And it's good to ask yourself, who am I partnering with? Because anyone, anyone can be spurred in a moment. I'm not, I don't want to spur you in a moment. See, because what it is, is it's, it's consistency and persistence that makes the change. Listen, putting the trash bag and attention to detail one time means nothing. Where's your heart? Who has it? That's what I'm talking about. That's what he's talking about. That's what all of all this is about. But, but we're going to receive our tithes and offerings, and I know some of you prepared to do that already. Um, and, and so we're going to do that, and we're going to pray over our tithes and offerings. And I would ask this, that even when you give, that let's not let our giving just become mundane. Let, let's not let it just become a pattern. This is what I do. I don't even, I'm not even aware of what leads my hand as a worship and a sacrifice and an honor for his glory. Listen, if it's no longer moving me, is it still moving him? If it doesn't move me, have you learned to budget off of your tithe? In other words, that just what goes? If it, do, if it, doesn't, if it doesn't cost me, if it doesn't move me, is it moving him? Sometimes I need to be moved to see that God is still moving. To recognize that, that, that I, I would recognize that he's talking to me and he's drawn in my heart and he's asking this of me. But he's still speaking. He's still healing. He's still doing what only he can do. So I just ask you this morning, what does it look like to partner with him? What does it look like? And does it look like I am partnering with him? Would the world be able to tell? No, no, that's not who I'm trying to please. Would the world say I'm a giver? No, no, that's not what, who I'm trying to please. Do everything unto the glory of God. Unto the glory of God. Father, we just prayed this morning over these tithes and these offerings that we bring and we lay at your feet. You said here on earth, Men receive tithes, but you receive them in heaven. Father, we give them to you this morning. We give you our best. We give you our lives. And we just tell you that we love you this morning. Lord, I thank you. We just lift these, these tithes and offerings up before you. And we just say, bless them. We bless them. I thank you that they be multiplied. They go further. Lord, I ask you even now for wisdom, how to steward every dollar that comes in for the glory, for your glory, for your glory. Lord, show, show us how to sharpen the sword, to carry a message further, individually and corporately. Lord, that we be about carrying the gospel, the good news, that every day. I just ask you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said...
check, check, check. Hey, you ready to hear uh, just a little bit? I'm aware of the time. I looked at the clock. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So what I'm going to share with you this morning is week two of fundamentals. And last week, just a quick, uh, quick review. If we're going to, the most fundamental thing that we could ever get is that we are functioning um, on this earth as a created being. There is a creator and you could call him coach, you could call him, he is king of kings, lord of lords, but he is the one that, that, that teaches us or lays what would be the most fundamental thing of all, and that is how things work. The ground rules, the rules, we kind of talked about that last week, and how nobody ever got upset um, uh, in, in, at a ref because they blew the whistle when you were running with the ball and saying, you're just trying to put me under the rules, Right? No, nobody ever said that. There are certain rules that not only is basketball governed by, but this life is governed by, and it is the creator that set those in, into motion, okay? So there are natural laws that we know, like gravity, right, or the law of lift or the law of thrust, okay? We, there's these laws that Sir Isaac Newton did not invent. He discovered what God had already created, but there's also spiritual laws that are here that we operate by whether you know them or not, and Sir Nate Newton might give you a few of them this morning, all right? Um, Nate's Newtons, right? Isn't there like a new, anyway, all right. Nature Nate, honey, there's a Nature Nate, honey. All right, Jeremy, anyway, all right, let's get back to where we're at. All right. You ready? So this morning, last, last week we just talked about the creator. The most fundamental thing we could ever, ever, ever settle in our hearts is that, that he's the creator and I'm not. That he is all powerful. We said omni, which meaning all, all powerful, all present, right? All knowing. In, in my notes uh, this morning, I, I kind of changed that a little bit. It's omnipotent means he can do it. Like when it comes to finances, if we get this, this, this fundamental thing down, if I realize that I serve an omni-God, an omnipotent God, it means all-powerful, here's what it means concerning my finances. He can do it. He can do it. So maybe you're standing up against something that's super big. He can do it. Omni-God. All powerful God, Creator, the earth is His. The cattle on the the cattle on the thousand hills, the, the silver, the gold are mine. He says it's all His. And guess what? He's all powerful. You know what? He can do it. Foundational, omni, omniscient, omniscient. What omni meaning all? You know what that means? He knows the answer. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? I just don't know. I da, 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 da. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Did you know that He's omniscient, which means all knowing, which means simply this. God has the answer. That's what we're talking about. We got a creator. He, he set the rules. He knows some things that you and I don't. He knows the end from the beginning. And so if he gives us a direction because he knows, he knows, he's a, he has the answer. Listen, if I settle that, if I surrender to the coach and to the rules of the game, if you will, the laws that he put in place, then guess what? I will function in omni, all I'll have all power. I'm coming underneath of the all-powerful, the one who can. I'm coming underneath of the one that has all the answers. Guess what? He has the answers. If I, if I get this, if I understand that he is omnipresent, here's what I know, that he's aware. He is aware. He's present and aware. He's omnipresent. He's all-present. That means he's with me here. He says he knows what you need before you even ask, but we've become so self-sufficient, unaware of his omnipotent, on his power that's available to you and to me that we don't engage him when we have a need, though he is aware before you even ask, because he's omnipresent, he's aware and he's present. He's aware and he's present, he can do it, and he's got the answer. That's what we talked about last week, even if you didn't hear it. That way I'm telling you today, the most fundamental thing, number one, that we could ever get down is we have a creator. And he loves, loves, loves his creation. What is man, he says, that you are so mindful of him? What is this that you would lay down? Your only son for him. If we could get that, if we could get that, number one, we would, our dollars, I'm telling you, they wouldn't be such a big thing because he's bigger. Why? Because he can do it. Why? Because he's got the answer. Why? Because he's present and aware. When you come with him with a need, he's not like, oh, shoot, what am I going to do? 
Number two, this is this week's, <clears throat> um, I don't want to title this because of the time. <laughs> we're just going to call it building. We're going we're gonna to just talk to this about, um, about um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to call it building. Did you know that you're a builder? Did you know that you're a builder? Did you know that there's no other creation like you? There's not any other creation that's created in God's image and his likeness. You're a creator. Satan stands in awe of you. Satan stands in awe of you. He wishes he was like you. Satan's most powerful time ever that he'll ever will be is when he takes on the form of a man, when he becomes the Antichrist. That's the most powerful he'll ever be is when he can possess a man. Although his power is increased and very present upon this earth when he partners with a man. When he partners with a man. God created you to build. You're a builder. You're a builder. How do I build? I build with the words of my mouth. The same way that God built in Genesis. So because I'm a builder, guess what? God knows that. I'm often not aware of it. I'm often not aware of what comes out of my mouth. And that I'm actually agreeing with what the enemy says instead of what God says. And the reason why this is so key and why it's so important is this. I want you to see this, all right? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says this, for though we live in the flesh, okay, this natural world, we don't wage war against the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not the mighty weapons of the world. Instead, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, we tear down strongholds and every presumption set up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience as soon as your obedience is complete. Here's what's going on here. This, this, this passage, just give you a little history a lesson here. Paul is coming to the church and he's telling them, hey, guys, when I come to you, when I'm speaking to you, the, my, our goal is not to get you to conform like this. It's to change the way you think based upon what God says. So I'm presenting the truth of God's word to do something, to tear down strongholds to tear down a place that you've built in your mind see here's the deal the enemy cannot build again you're a builder satan is not a builder you are the enemy cannot build anything in your life that you don't allow but he can suggest and he does suggest often to get you to take what he suggests and lay a stone in your mind. There are some things that are in our lives. There are some of you that are sitting here and you've sat under, you, you, were, grew, you grew up in church. And if you were to look at your tax return and you were to look at a giving statement that got passed out, you probably would recognize that your giving didn't match the tithe or didn't match what you thought you should have. And yet you've sat in church all these years, but what's happened is, is you have taken a suggestion, it doesn't pay. Uh, do you know how much that costs? I mean, these are enemy suggestions that is contrary to what God says. This is how he always works. He comes with the word that sounds close enough, that sounds reasonable, and he wants you to take it. This is how offense works, too. He comes with the word, and he it gets it to sound just right, shows you where you're right, and gets you to come and look at the tree, come and, you, and then you're like, yeah, yeah, nothing's happening. And, and I, yeah, I don't see it. I don't. And what you do is you take that stone, you take that, that word, legos, lego, that's where we get the word lego, you take that brick, and you set it, whether you realize it or not, it gets set in your mind. And then Satan's really great because he knows what he's working towards. He's got a box, right? Like, you know, you get at Christmas, it's like, oh, look at the spaceship, or hey, look at it, it's a fire truck. He's got a picture for your life that would fit you and would be work to steal, kill, and destroy 
your life, the things that are most precious to you. And so he has a picture on his box, and he says, hey, try the green one. Oh, here, oh, you've been looking for this piece? Oh, you've been looking for this piece? And what happens is, is he suggests to you and to me things contrary to what God has said, and he wants us to set it. He wants us to say it. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. There are things that you say in your heart that never come out of your mouth. And what you agree with, you set in your mind. Now, why is that so key? Because a stronghold is a setting, or if you can imagine, a tower. A tower is not made from one brick. A tower is made from a block that's been set, and a block that's been set, and a block that's been set, and a block that's been set. And what the enemy would love to do is build a fortress in your mind where he can wage war from, and you don't even know it. It's an inside job. I don't know what, what's happening. Have you ever seen these movies where somebody gets on the inside and they're creating mass chaos and mass destruction and all these kind of things and nobody, can know, nobody knows why and what's going on until somebody spots or finds out and they, they get them, eradicate them out of there? That's what we have to realize. This is how Satan works. He's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. He'll pretend to be like God. That's what he, just, the Bible tells us, that he'll even disguise himself as an angel of light. But yet he won't call him Lord. That's how you know the difference. If you ever see something and, and, and you see uh, like a demonic spirit or a spirit, even an angel, the Bible tells us that he can act as an angel of light. You would ask him, is Jesus your Lord? Do you call Jesus Lord? And he, he will not surrender lordship to him. Listen, there are thoughts that you've received, and oftentimes that, that, that say something different than what the Lord has said. That's how I know if, if, I'm, if I'm being duped to build the enemy's plan. If what I receive is not what he said, I don't care if it's concerning finances, concerning healing. Oh, it's going to be a long road to recovery. Really? Is that what God said? But you can let him work right, right here. Right tight. Just why don't you just build them? Why don't you just put up a little cardboard puppet tent deal in the hospital room and just say Satan lives here? Because you're receiving and you're allowing not truths but suggestions to become true to you. And you take those and you think those in your heart, and, and unless we understand how. To combat the very place and to tear down the very place that Satan wants to wage war from, we will be whooped often and not know why. So what does he say? Paul says, hey guys, I'm not coming to get you to conform. Fundamental number, number, the number two, we're talking about building. What I'm talking about is not to get you to conform. Listen, it's your life. God gave it to you to steward I mean, he holds it, but, but he gave it to you to make the choice. What will you do? What will? What choice will you make? I'm not saying this to conform you. You keep on doing what you want to do. If you want to serve Jesus and serve God, do it. But even Malachi, we're not talking about that this morning. It was the priests that got rebuked and the people. By Malachi, which means the messenger. The priest, the one that was supposed to be representing God to the people because he was accepting their crap. Like as a pastor that's supposed to be representing God, you say, oh, you said, you said the C word. I'm telling you, you're given C word. If you're griping about that, I can tell you right now that, you, you, right now that you're not given jack. So I don't care if you get offended because I'm not trying to offend you. I'm talking to what God is saying and putting, calling to you attention, calling to us as attention. This is what God's saying. And we as pastors have allowed junk, the blind, the sick, the lame, to be received as, oh, that's good. Good job. 
pastors don't even know what their, their, the church is giving anymore because, well, uh, you might be offended if, if, if the pastor knew what you gave. I hope you would. But it just tells me this. If you're more offended if a pastor knew what you gave, then you're serving the wrong one, and your fear is of man more than it is of God. And that's wrong. That's so wrong. And that's even what's kept the pastors shut up concerning finances, fear of man. That's trash. Don't build your home and not build his. Don't build your home and not build his. Don't do it. That's what he said. Don't do it. Check yourself. That's what he said. Why? Because he loves you. when I'm not surrendered to him, when I don't recognize him, what happens is what he says is treated lightly, and the way I think in a suggestion is treated with more regard, and I begin to build the very place in the very fortress from which the enemy brings destruction into my home. What I'm not surrendered to, listen, I will walk away from. And it is the love of God, it's the goodness of God that brings the word of God that leads us to honor him. Now, I have 15 minutes, I'm going to go here. Go with me to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, this is a very, very profound story. This is Abraham, the father of our faith. The one that we're supposed to be patterning our lives after. But I want you to give you the background of this story. It's really powerful. There's these kings. And if, you, if I could draw this picture, if you just close your mind, all right, close your eyes, and just listen, I'm going to draw a picture of a landscape for you, okay? Now, north is at the top, okay? And north, there's a sea, a big, a big sea. It's called the Sea of Galilee. And out of the Sea of Galilee flows a river. And that river flows down and waters a, a great valley. And this valley is flat and it's lush. It's what we now know below the Sea of Galilee where this river flows is now the Dead Sea. It never used to be there. Very lush land. Okay, now, so you see this picture of the Sea of Galilee. You see this river that flows out and then it flows in to now what we know as the Dead Sea, which is a product of what the, the, historically they say there's all these things here, even in the Dead Sea, it's like there was life here. Yeah, there was. Sodom and Gomorrah is what was the cause of that place, of desolate, where, where, where things can't grow in salt, right? And so you have these, this king, this, there's, this, there's this territory, the Chedorlaomer. or he is the king of this territory, and he owns basically all around that lake, all down, all the good stuff. And if you know anything about Israel, it's mountains and desolate and mountains and desolate, but all of that snow and all of that stuff on the mountains comes down and it filters this really lush valley. And he is ruling all the, the kings of this valley, him and four kings. Well, he was, he, all of it's underneath of just his rule, but what happens is five kings get together, Sodom, Gomorrah, and a few others, three, three more, get together, and they say, I am so tired of being underneath the rule of this guy. So it comes to Elam, the, the Elamites, or the, the, the king, King Chedorlaomer. or Ch Ch I can't even say the word right, so long. But he it comes to him and he says, hey, hey you, hey you. And he allies himself with three other kingdoms and says, hey, become my ally or I'm going to whoop your tail too. But if you, wanna, you want a piece of the spoil, come fight with me and we're going to knock out all these kings and make sure that they don't ever rise up again against us. You take everything they got, right? So here's what happens. These five kings, Sodom, Gomorrah, and these other ones come and they wage war against Elam. And guess what? Elam, these four kings, destroys these five kings. And he takes off running with all. They don't even take off running. They defeat them so bad. And they take all their spoils. The Bible says that Sodom ran to the hills. Gomorrah ran to the hills. But all of the spoil was taken by the king. So guess whose rule they're still under? Elam's. Okay? 
But what the problem was, and here's where we're going to see, is that Abraham caught wind of what had happened because among the spoil was his nephew Lot. Why? Because he was living in Sodom at that time. Why? Because that's the place that was all green and lush. And Abraham said, where do you want to go to Lot? And Lot's like, I'll take that green area to raise my flocks. Because they had already increased so much with stuff. that they, 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 There were fights going on between Lot's people and Abram's people. And so there was a great feud. And finally Abram said, hey, it's not good to dwell together if there's going to be arguments. Here, God has given us this land of promise. Where do you want? And he said, I'll take the green side. Come on. And so he goes to this place of, the, of green. And so he's living in Sodom. Okay, it, 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 it's a picture of Satan. Okay, you can look it up, Sodom, sodomy, all these kind of things. Sodom, and you can look at this, and that's the place he chooses. It looks good. The grass is always greener there, right? And so Abram takes his way, but what comes to his, comes to his attention is they got Lot. So what does Abram do? Let's go ahead and read. Let's read here in Genesis 14, 11 through 24, uh, verse 12. And so they also carried off Abram's uh, nephew, Lot, and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now, Abram was living near the great trees of, of, of so basically, if, if you're looking here, Abram's down below. The, the sea's here, and the river flows here, and Abram's down over here, and news comes. Okay, well, Abram, after he hears the news, he gets 318 men, and you can keep up with me in this storytelling, all right? 318 men to go against these four armies, and he chases all the way up to right where the, the sea is. He catches up with them, and he takes and wages a war against them and defeats the kings. 318 men. Listen, God did that. Not 318 men. God did that. Listen, there's a lot of victories in our lives. God did that. Whether we give him glory or not, God did it. Whether we give him a piece of the cake, listen, it was his spoil, okay? And so you go on, it says this in verse 17, after Abram returned from de defeating uh, Ketelamer and the kings that were allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava. Now, what's, if you can see this picture, Abraham was down here. He chased him all the way up here, defeats him, and defeats him again up here. Like, he doesn't just leave any of them left. So he finishes the job. Now he's up here and he decides to come back here on the other side of the valley that was green where he was once living because it was easier for him to come back this way. And as he's running down, the, or not come, running, but he's coming back down where Sodom had fled, which is up to these hills, okay, he sees Abraham and all this spoil, or Abram and all this spoil, okay? So he's up there looking in the hills and he's seeing, oh man, look at that's Abram. Oh, wow, look at all of us. Hey, that's that person. That, and, and, and Abram took back not just the possessions, but the people, the wives and the children that were stolen. Okay? So you see this marching of all, this great arm, or army, but also great spoils of war carrying loads, not just their stuff, but the kings of the, of the four kings that once ruled over them. And they're coming back, and listen to this. The king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavad, which is the king's valley. So you got Abram. All these people, and Sodom comes down, the king of Sodom. And then all of a sudden shows up another one. His name's Melchizedek. Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which Melchizedek means king of righteousness. King of Salem means king of peace, Jerusalem, king of peace. So this is a picture, really, of Jesus, the king of righteousness, coming out to meet him. And he brings out bread and wine representing what we see. It's a type and shadow. The Old Testament is types and shadows. Listen, the Old Testament's not done away with. It foretold what was yet to come. Matter of fact, the church that we read about, the only letters they had was that, okay? So here's the deal. He, he brings out bread and wine to meet him, and here's what he says, because that's what God, Jesus is. This is how we know it's also Jesus represented here. He gives glory to God. Jesus always gives glory to the Father. He, he was a high priest of God most high. That's who we still, high priest. And he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high. Bless, he, so he, can you imagine he's commanding the blessing on Abram. He said, blessed be Abram by God most high. Creator of heaven and earth. Next verse. And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. 
Then Abraham, or Abram, gave him a tenth of everything. Now, why did he do that? He recognized presence. Sodom was right there too. Listen to what happens next. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, How can I, there's a song, How can I stand here with you and not be moved by you? How could it be? There's a song that says, I'm standing in God's presence. I'm standing before God's presence. And I'm not moved. Not one iota, not one little bit, not one tiddlywink, not nothing. Sodom is standing right there. And he sees and he senses the presence of God. But he's not moved by it at all. And he's not moved by the blessing. And this is a picture of the world, the church and the world in the church. Not moved. And here's what he sees. He sees, he says, give me the people and the good and keep the goods for yourself. Here's what he's saying. Give me what you won. Give me what God gave you. And you can keep some for yourself. He said, let's make a covenant. You give me this, I'll offer you protection. Let's have, that's what's going on here. And here's what he's saying. The blessing means nothing. The blessing of a priest, the blessing of God. Man, I, I see the spoils of war as being so much greater. I see the spoils of what I've got in my hand and what God has given to me, whether I recognize that or not, that it was God that won this great victory. I see that as greater than walking in partnership, blessing. That's what it is. Blessed simply means this. If you ever hear that being blessed and say, I bless you, or you hear the, the blessing of the Lord, it simply means with God. You know what cursed is? That's it. And he said, I want to get with God. This is something that you see in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He said, I want to be with him. We were talking about setting stones, weren't we? We were talking about building in our lives, talking about what you build in your mind. Did you know that it says this in, in uh, Colossians 3, verse 1, to set your heart on things above? Set your heart, set your mind, set your, on things. You can set your heart on things above. How do you do that? Same way that Abraham did with, with his treasure. With his treasure. This is a, this is a, a, a natural, not a natural, this is a, a spiritual law that the creator put into play that where you put your strength, where you put your resources, your dollars, what's going to happen is you're going to be tied to that. You want to, you, so in essence, he was protecting his relationship that had already begun with God. Yet one was there saying, hey, Make a covenant with me. Here's what's the most amazing thing. Abraham does that. Or Abram at the time. His name hadn't been changed yet. He, 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 after, he, said, he tells him this. He, said, he tells Sodom, he said, I'm not giving, I'm not taking anything. I don't want anything. You have it all. I don't want none of this. Because I'm not going to say, lest any man say, you made me rich. Why would that have been possible if he gave everything away or if he took what he had already won? Because he would have been entering covenant. And he would have recognized that what I have is yours and what you have is mine. And so that my, in a sense, this king of all this valley where he was a guy that traveled in tents, but now that he has this kingdom back, right? Everything that he has is his and everything that I have is mine. And so he would have been making a deal ultimately with the devil because he's saying, I can offer you all of this. It's the same picture of Jesus standing up on the mountaintop. And he said, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not doing that. Unless you say that you made me rich. No one can say that but God. But then, listen, he went away. And Abraham, Abram, he was in his heart, he said, Lord. He said, I'm your reward. I'm this, I'm this. And he said, Lord, how am I going to pass down all these things that, you're, that you promised me? The blessing. He just, he got the blessing. He got the blessing. He didn't have all this. He got the blessing. Listen, he got the blessing. He was walking with him. He said, what does this all mean? I don't have anybody in my own house. I don't even have a child to pass this down to. 
And what happened is the same thing you see in Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring your tithes to the storehouse and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that there's not room enough to receive. What do you see? You see this is when God himself came down in chapter 15. God himself, heaven moved because he moved. I'm telling you, he couldn't produce a kid. He couldn't produce a kid with his own child. He couldn't, he couldn't do what he couldn't do, but God came down and did because of what he could do. Now here's where this goes wrong. If you give right now, if you give today, right now $100, God will hear your prayer. That's trash. It's deceitful and it's trash. But the principle remains whether it's been abused, and this is why it's been abused, because Satan doesn't want you to operate by a spiritual principle. And that is this, to whom, if you honor God, he will honor you. It's a principle, and what does honor look like? Honor looks like what our father did. He was our teacher. Don't tell me, and he tells us to set our hearts, set, set your hearts on things above, set your heart, minds on things above. How do you do that? The Bible says in Matthew 6, where you, 21, where your treasure is, set that, your heart will be knit there. Listen, when you do that, what happens is all of a sudden, he, you, you're in partnership with him, you realize, Father, I'm in partnership with you, and there's a covenant, there's an exchange. When we enter covenant today, let's talk about that for a moment. We enter covenant, and we're closing with this. We enter covenant today, and we, we, there's this, this term, even like we were singing this morning, holy, you know, like it's not that, that sound, but that was the word, okay? Holy, 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 three holy, four holies, okay? I, I, I was singing that, and I said, holy, you're perfect, Lord, you're perfect. He said, that's incomplete, and, and I responded back, yeah, but it makes more sense in today's day and age. Like, in other words, this is just in my heart. This is what's going on. And he said, that's the problem. There's some things that you need to teach. And you need to bring that it's always been. In heaven, they're crying, holy, holy, holy. In heaven, they're saying this. This is how you need to say what I say, not what makes sense to you. What does that mean? We need to bring some of the ways that God thinks into this generation instead of letting ourselves go so far from what he said and only operate based on what makes sense to us. That's craziness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy is, and I don't even know where I was going to go and close with the message. But so, um, <laughs> huh? I was talking about covenant. Yeah. Sometimes from, yeah, sometimes I just like, woo, all right. Um, but talking about covenant, I don't know where I was going to go. So in just for time right now, 1130, I want to, I want to close. Covenant. We accept Jesus, but we don't understand covenant. Everything that he has, his righteousness, is mine. Everything that he has, healing, is mine. Everything that he has, everything that I am, is his. This is that covenant. But when covenant was cut, there would be an exchange. And I think that that's where maybe as a church we're missing some of what God is wanting to pour out the windows of heaven so that there's not room enough to receive and God to move I think we're the 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 covenant when when the covenant was cut there would be blood but there would also be the gift not a have to not a have to but a gift and that gift would be one of honor, one of weight to display everything that I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. And I believe that that's one of the pieces in the church that we have let slide. We've let slide. And God wants to bring that back. He wants to bring your awareness and my awareness that what? God wants to be involved in every area of my life. And he wants to be a part of building, building what he's designed before I was ever born. Before you were born, he created, he had a plan and prepared good works for you to walk in. And that's what he's about doing still to this day.
Amen. I saw in my heart this morning to close this service with uh, singing this song. Um, and I just wanted to uh, have you just sit there and be ministered to. It's a declaration of God's worth. And I believe it's the cry of your heart. But I just wanted us to just to sit in our chairs and just be ministered to uh, in song as we close. And then also, um, while this is going on, if you need agreement in prayer for anything, or if you're saying, hey, I'm here, Pastor, and I've been wanting to give my heart to Jesus, or I just know in my heart I need to give my, my life to him, man, come up here. Um, we'll have a prayer team, and, and I'll be up here too. We'd love to see God work on your behalf. But other than that, we're just going to let this happen. And then, uh, Pastor Evan, when you're done, you can dismiss, okay? Thank you. you so much we are going to dismiss but before we do i do want to let you know um, our pastors and leaders will be up here if you do need prayer and you want to come up after service they'll be here but also i want to remind you we've got starting points starting here in about 10 or 15 minutes so even if you didn't sign up we would love to have you join us out here in fact uh, see our team at the connection center out in the lobby and they can let you know where to go and uh we'll feed you take care of your kids get to know you it'll be a fun time so we look forward to seeing you there other than that you guys have a blessed week